Good Monday morning and thanks for listening to my musing today, which is about imagination, specifically moral or prophetic imagination. You are probably familiar with the passage in Isaiah 2, starting in verse 4, that says the wolf will lie down with the kid, or sometimes we remember that as the lion will lie down with the lamb, that people will beat their swords into plowshares and they won't study war anymore. As we look through history, we don't find a lot of times where literally people have beaten their swords into plowshares, or figuratively they have changed their uh, weapons of war into implements of creativity or, or farm implements or whatever the case may be. And so what day was Isaiah talking about? Well, the day of the Lord is the answer the long-awaited day of the Lord. The day of the Lord that meant something for people in the Old Testament, that Jesus talks about regularly, and that even today, 2,000 years removed from the life of the historical Jesus, we still imagine when swords are beaten into plowshares, we have no need for war anymore, every tear is wiped away from the eye, and we know peace. So what is happening in that passage? I think, specifically, and this is also according to Walter Brueggemann, the Old Testament scholar, Isaiah is practicing something called prophetic imagination. He's giving us an imaginary glimpse into what the world could be if the world was at peace, that even the lion and the lamb, natural predators, would lie down in peace. The child would play over the nest of the asp and would not be stricken. Now, do we think that's actually going to happen within history? Uh, in some senses, it's written to be beyond history. It is the peaceable kingdom. It is uh, like the Garden of Eden. Nothing is harmed and everything is right with the world. And because of that vision, whenever we have songs related to that vision, Perhaps it attunes us in our desires about what we would hope for, not just on the day of the Lord and not just beyond history, but in some sense within history. There are lots of places where we have what are often called flights of fancy. When people make certain kinds of proposals for the ways that the church should act or the ways that societies should act, they're easily dismissed as nonsense. And I am musing today about the place of that imaginary nonsense. How do we take certain maybe serious proposals about what the church could do or what our governments could do or what society at large does, and how do we say there is a place and a space for us to do exactly what the term moral imagination implies? Imagine the world as it could be not as it ought to be necessarily, not in terms of what our next action items and steps forward might be, but what value do we gain by stretching our imagination muscles to think about what our deepest uh, hopes might be for a world of peace, a, word, a world of freedom, a world of equity, and how might our imagining start to shape the historical world in which we live? When was the last time you daydreamed about how you imagine the world to be? When was the last time you listened to John Lennon's song named Imagine? That's what I've been musing about a little bit, especially as we think about Russia invading Ukraine and all sorts of trouble in the world. Uh, it might be compelling and tempting to think we need to talk about brass tacks in the moment about how we respond. That is well and good. But at some point, we have to find time also to imagine and listen to the moral imaginations and the prophetic imaginations that have come before us to think about how our minds might be shaped in the hope that there is some place for us to talk seriously about what it might mean 
to beat our swords into plowshares, weapons of destruction turned into implements of creation. That's what I've been musing about, and I have a little bit more to say in specific ways that people have done some moral imagining and some things that you might want to play with as you daydream. So if you're interested in those sorts of things, then I hope you will stick around. Basic universal income. Imagine that everyone in the world is broken out of the mold of living by a dollar or two dollars a day, and we all have a little something coming in our pockets. And why not? It used to be the case that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were all invested in agriculture or things very materialistic, that they were weavers who had to shear goats and sheep, and they worked on looms in their cottages, and they scrapped together their money. Now we have the Industrial Revolution. We have just as many shirts coming out, just as much linen, just as much cotton, just as much uh, in the way of foodstuffs. So all the money that's made from that, and all the people who no longer need to be out in a field with a hoe, where does all that money go? Where is the time to just sit around and do nothing? I mean, we probably need more middle managers now to make sure that everything is running efficiently, but for all that money and free time that we were supposed to get through mechanization, what are we supposed to do with it? Maybe it's the case that there is something like a freedom dividend, where because we live in such a prosperous world, not just a prosperous country, everyone is able to take home a little bit just because we're doing so amazingly well. You might immediately think, well, that sounds lazy, and why would we want to do something like that? Why would we just give money away? I bring you to the reason why we put our money in interest-yielding accounts. Make your money do the work. Just sit around and watch it grow. It's like people who put oil wells on their field or windmills on their property. If I had a wind turbine on my property, I would buy the best rocking chair that money could afford, and I would just watch that thing spin and watch the dollar signs go up in my head. Because I don't really want to work hard, I just want to watch money roll into my account. Moral <laughs> imagination. In some ways, that's how we imagine pensions or retirement. It was not always the case that there was such a thing as retirement. It was not always the case that there were pensions. Someone imagined that after a lifetime work, worth of work, if you made it to a certain age and you had worked all your life, at a certain point, other people are supposed to take care of you. That wasn't a reality until someone dreamed it up. Maybe there are good reasons, and you are imagining those morally or prophetically, about why a universal basic income should not happen. We should not make steps in that sort of direction. And that is fine. The point is, I imagine that a universal basic income pretty dramatically alters the way we think about receiving funds from all of the economy that exists around us. And wouldn't it be nice if you just sat around for a day while you're on a long car ride or while you're waiting for a show to start or there's a long line for a drive through where you're picking up a coffee or something to think? What sort of difference would a universal basic income make? How many people would continue to work hard because you probably want to make a little more than the bare minimum, maybe? How many freeloaders do you think they would be? How much retirement and social security do you need if you're always guaranteed a paycheck? Would this change the way that we fund college? Would this way change the way we think about medical costs or retirement and pensions if instead there was one larger program based in universal basic income? Would you change it based on your location? Would you change it based on your age so that something like a program for universal basic income would guarantee a retirement for everyone? so that certain programs, like Medicare and Medicaid, weren't continually cash-strapped uh, by older people. I have no idea. I am not trying to get this program off the ground. I'm just saying that I've been on a long car ride where I heard something on some radio station about giving people free money, and I thought, I like free money. What would that look like? That's an example of moral imagination. Imagining the world if it were just a little bit different based on some sort of policy. We don't necessarily need to act on it unless our imagination captures us so much 
that we want to see a certain way of being put into practice. There are other policies that are often touted, at least fra phrases in the news and in the media and books that we might read that pique my interest. Uh, notably, a powerful one that drew a lot of ire was defund the police. I'm not asking you what your opinion is about defunding the police. I'm asking how much time did you take to imagine what that would look like? Once upon a time, I lived in London. And famously, London police officers, bobbies they call them, don't carry guns. There are a whole lot of reasons why England is different than the United States when it comes to guns. There are large histories related to that. And, uh, but it is the case that while living there, I wondered what would it be like if all of the United States police officers carried little sticks, little billy clubs, instead of firearms. Just as a flight of fancy, just to imagine it. Not to say that that would work here, we are a different culture, not to say that that's important, just to say I've imagined what that would be like. Imagining, willing ourselves to imagine, willing to talk about our daydreams, about different ways that the world could be, not unlike the lion laying down with the lamb, which probably means that humans are not supposed to eat lamb either. I don't know that for sure. Maybe we're the only carnivores left or omnivores left. But it just means we're able to think about new ways of being. In Genesis, we read that God gives humanity stewardship of the earth, often translated as dominion over the earth. And we have seen in mighty ways how we are able to shape the world around us with concrete and steel, with electricity, with 24-hour uh, cities, with McDonald's, with uh, refrigeration, with all sorts of things, with massive earth movers. We can shape the world in so many ways that people have to imagine before they implement. And so what sorts of ideas catch your fancy? How do you play with them in the most imaginative ways. Once upon a time, we watched shows like Star Trek, where they had little blocks that were completely wireless that allowed them to communicate with one another. We saw people talking on their wrists through little responders. And here I am talking to you with almost no strings attached. I have an iPhone in my pocket, just a little brick that helps me to FaceTime or call anyone anywhere around the world. Through the internet, there are not even charges related to international Skype or Zoom fees. And I can do all of that if I want on my wrist responder, Apple Watch. Those things have become realities. Human flight. How long did it take for the first people to think, man, I wish I was a bird, until we saw the Wright brothers taking flight based on some crazy things that da Vinci drew up hundreds of years earlier. It is the case, and we have seen evidence, that the things that we imagine sometimes become a reality. So can our moral and prophetic imagination catch up with our scientific, technological, uh, engineering, and mathematical imagination? It needs to, in some sense. If we imagine uh, the ethical concerns and the ethical possibilities of things like CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, then perhaps we can stay ahead of science in some ways and arenas. What does cloning mean for the future? We already know that there was a clone war based on the imaginations of Star Wars. So how do we play into that, enjoy that, discuss our differences? I think that is a task that God gives to us, which is an enjoyable task. God gives us our imagination, which as best as we can tell, is a fairly large separation between us and the rest of the animal world. Sure, there are some great apes who've decided that rocks and sticks make a pretty good hammer, but we're the only ones with jackhammers. We're the only ones with hydraulic uh, pumps for cast iron and those sorts of things. So what are the sorts of worlds and imaginings that you have that spark your interest, that are worth sharing. Because we need to think about the ways that the world could be if we ever hope to change it from the ways that it is. 
knowing that that started an awfully long time ago. Isaiah, a person who was afflicted by the Assyrians and then had his people displaced by the Babylonians, imagined a world in the midst of all of that chaos where it was complete peace. Even the wolf and the lamb could lie down together. That was the world he wanted to imagine when the world he saw was so far removed from that world of peace. What are the things that we really strive for? How do we reach for them? As Emerson says, with a reach that exceeds our grasp, or else what's a heaven for? How do you imagine that peaceable kingdom that you would like to be a part of? And maybe if you think about it long enough, how do you make some of those imaginings and fantasies become a reality? That's what I've been musing about today, and I hope you will too. Email me your craziest ideas. Maybe I'll send them out to others and, uh, and we'll have an award for the craziest moral imaginings that you could come up with. Thanks for listening to my musing today. I'm sure I'll have another, and I'll share it with you next Monday.